All right, let's get out of our study. This is the second week when we're looking at the Torah. And uh, again, we talked about the difference between what we're looking at and biblical numerology. Biblical numerology is the significance of the numbers and their uh, meaning, that numbers have meaning, and also that you can add numbers together to get specific things out of the word. Now that's numerology. Yes, numerology can be used by, by New Agers and by fortune tellers and stuff like that. But let's face it, God starts it and the world copies it, okay? It's like uh, the Bible's very clear that God puts signs in the stars for us to follow and to tell us uh, and to communicate with us. But astrology takes that and, and turns it into a counterfeit. There has to be a real something for something to be counterfeited. No one in the world is going to accept a counterfeit $7 bill at a store. You're not going to take a $7 bill that's counterfeit and go, here, will you take this and give me change? No. Why? Because there's no such thing as a $7 bill. But it's the counterfeit 1s, 5s, 10s, and 20s that are counterfeit. They're successful. Why? Because there are 1s, 5s, 10s, and 20s. And so yeah, the, same, the same is true with all of God's creation, that the devil is not creative. We've looked at that in Scripture before, that the devil doesn't have a creative bone in his body. He is a counterfeiter and a copier. But God is creative. Yes. God is infinitely creative. And so what he did in the stars to communicate to man, the devil tries to pervert and use otherwise. The same with numerology. There are many, many things in the Bible that God tries to communicate to us through numerology. And then the devil comes along and says, yeah, so do I. Okay. And so when we look at this, we say that like May 14th, 1948 is the day of independence for the state of Israel. And so if we look at it numerologically, we have five and five, because one and four becomes five. Right. And uh, then we skip the 19. Usually in, the, in Jewish numerology, they skip the first two day or the numbers of the year and go to the second, because they don't count centuries in what they do. So you don't count the 1600s, the 1500s, the 1400s. You count the one through 100 of the second numbers. So we drop the 19. We drop the 19th, so we have May 14th, that's 5 and 5, and then we have 48, and 48, 4 plus 8 equals 12, 1 plus 2 equals 3. So what we end up with is the fifth book of the Bible, the fifth chapter of the third verse, Deuteronomy 5, 3. And when we look at Deuteronomy 5, 3, the date of independence of the nation of Israel, it reads this way. I have the slides so we can kind of get through to our introduction. The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, with all of those of us alive here today. What a verse to speak to the day of independence for the nation of Israel, yeah. May 14, 1948. So, that's numerology. What we're talking about is Torah time. And the Torah time is, a, is less than about three or four years old. Uh, some prophetic teachers have stumbled onto this. I, I, again, everything can become crazy and perverted. You can run too far with anything, you know. Right. Um, not every verse in the Bible has a hidden message of numerology. In it. Right. Just does not. But when we look at the chapters and verses of the, of the Old Testament, the Torah is the first five books, right? That's the Torah, or sometimes called, in, in Latin it's called the Pentateuch, well, really Greek, but they used it in Greek to say it. The Latin fathers did. Pentateuch meaning, meaning five. Okay, pentagram, five sides. So the Pentateuch, um, we're looking at Genesis, has 1,533 verses in it. Exodus has 1,213 verses, Leviticus 859. Numbers has 1,288 verses in it, and Deuteronomy has 959 verses, all right? So if we take the first five books, which are the books that were written by Moses, all of the other books are supplementary history, poetry, writing, they are the Word of God. They are not less than the Word of God. But this is the Word. Yes. The word Torah means the teaching. The teaching that was given by God. Yes, please. Is that Hebrew? The yes. Of the Hebrew? Yeah, this is, this is in when the uh, Hebrew uh, rabbi by the name of Nathan sat down and broke this into verses. Uh, and it was done in, I think, 1059, something like that we said last week. It was done in, before the Middle Ages. Um, that this was a Hebrew rabbi using a Hebrew Bible and breaking it down. 
when we translate it into the Greek and into the Latin and into the English, we use the same phrasing and have the same numbers. So we copied them. Okay. Also, so we have a total then in the Torah of 5,852 verses all together. Now, the idea is, what if the number of the verse equals the number of a year? Can we find out anything from that? Remember that the Jews believe that their numbering system of, of years begins with the year of creation. They believe that zero on their lunar calendar is the creation of Adam. Okay? Not the garden, but Adam. Adam is the beginning of time. And so uh, uh, with the beginning of time then, that Adam was created 4000 BC. Whether or not you look at science and go, but what about the old earth and the new earth and all that sort of stuff? The, simple, the answer is very simple. Even evolutionists believe that the world existed for millions of years before man ever came on the scene. Before there was any kind of a walking hominid, it was here. And so all of the evolution and all of the erosion and all of the movement of the planets and the tectonic plates could have happened long before this happened. That's one theory. The second theory is called the gap theory. The gap theory says the first verse and the second verse of Genesis have a gap. That it says, in the beginning, God created. Brought a sheet in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. And the, co the concept for the Jew is that what God creates is perfect. God didn't create anything. It has to evolve. He doesn't have anything that needs to be adapted or changed. Amen. So he created the world. The second verse says, and the world was without form and void. So something happened between verse 1 and verse 2. Again, we believe that this was the angelic war when Satan fell from heaven. And it says he was cast down to a devastated place, mm -hmm. a desolate place. Well, so the earth was perfect, the angelic war happened, the world was destroyed, and God rebuilt it so he could bring man on the sea. Thank you very much. That's the second theory. The third theory is that the world was created perfect, man was put on it, and the flood has done all of the destruction that we see. That the Grand Canyon there are scientists who now believe this, okay? There are scientists who now have written treatises on that. Some of them actually, the only reason I know about them is they got fired from their university for writing it. There's about six men that I know that I've read their treatises who were fired from the university because they dared go against the grain of evolutionary thought and saying that they actually can prove geologically that the Grand Canyon was created in a catastrophic, disastrous flood more than a long time of erosion. Yes. And, and so at any time you see long time, time, long time erosion, the, the destruction becomes wider, not narrow, and the Grand Canyon is actually narrower. And that's the sign of fast-moving, incredibly catastrophic waters. So I'll let you take the theory you want, OK? And I'll let you take the theory you want. I'm not going to tell you what to believe, but those are some of the major theorems of, of how this whole thing happened. But if the world is 4,000, if the, if the Old Testament began at 4,000 B.C. and Jesus came along at zero, right. around the zero range, and we have to be right. dogmatic about the year there, uh, he probably was not. He was probably not born in the year zero. He was probably born more in the year of, of, of the first 10 or 12 8 BC. But with that happening then, we're now into the 2000s, which means the world is a 6, 000, the humanity is 6,000 years old, all right? And we know that the days is 1,000 years, and so 6,000 years is seven days of creation, and on the seventh day he rested, and we know that in the end time there will be a 1,000 year millennium, which is the day of rest. That means we are in the last days. Thank you. Numerically, okay? If, if we go with that flow. And I'm saying you have to, I'm just saying you can. You can, you can look at that. So what we're looking at then is 5,852 verses in the Torah, which means just a little bit beyond the 4,000 and into the 2,000, 
and we're wrapping up and coming down into time if it's going to be over. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. that, that the year that the year 5852 ends the Torah. You're through with the book we by that now? time. We now? And so I'll show you. So, oh, okay. You're on the right track, though. So currently we're in 5799. This is the year. Now, where this gets to be a bit of a bugaboo, and, we, and again, this should not worry you. This should not throw you. You just have to, you know, it's like learning a new saddle. If you're a horseman and you get a new saddle, you and your rear end have to get, you know, used to the saddle and the heavy. Like wearing a new pair of shoes, your shoes and your feet have to get together. One of the things that we have to understand is that our years start in January. And the Jewish year starts in the fall. So when we say the Jewish year 5799, it goes from September to October. So that means the Jewish year 5799 could be the solar year of 2018 or 2019. So when we look at our year and their year, it could wiggle either way one verse. Does that make sense? Because it goes from, uh, from fall to fall in the Jewish calendar. So it starts in 2018, ends in 2019. That means the number of the verse in the Old Testament could be 2018 or 2019. There's some wiggle room here. Don't let that throw you. Don't let that bother you, okay? Uh, again, we're not creating dogma here. We're not creating new theorems of evangelism and how people are going to get saved. No, no, no. That doesn't change a bit, right? We're just having some fun with some verses and seeing if God has shown us some things that we've been blind to. And we've not noticed. Hallelujah. All right? So currently we're at 5799. September 29th is, is the Jewish New Year. This will be the Jewish New Year and the Rosh Hashanah. And uh, we'll see that and we will turn to the year 5780. Okay? 5780. Now, if we look at 5708, again, we did this last week. That we got the tape. But I'm just going to go boom, boom, boom right through it, okay? But when we look at 5708, the 5,708th verse of the Torah is 1948, okay? And that was Independence Day. And I'll let you read the verse, Deuteronomy 30.5, okay? If we look at 5712, then it says that I will make your land green and you will have fruit and all of that. And that is the year that the five major kibbutzes were created to garden Israel. And we saw how two of them... But one of them actually is selling pigs now. Yeah. A Jewish farm selling out raising pigs, which is unkosher. They're just not eat. But they'll, they'll, they'll farm it. <laughs> but they're also creating the new vegetables and the new fruits, and they've got three and four harvests a year instead of two seasons a year. They're going to three. I showed you some farming where they're using waterless farming now, mm -hmm. using condensation from the ground to water their own plants. And so this all began in the year 1952. 52 was the year that these programs and these kibbutzes were started. And the verse 5712 says that's going to happen. You see, this is what's going to happen next. Deuteronomy 30.13 is the year or the verse 5716. And in 1956 is when they when wholesale they began to pay for people from other countries to come, especially Poland, Germany and places like that. The word Aliyah means to go up or to go home. Amen. And so Aliyah is the Jewish word for people returning to Israel. The, they, um, if you watch advertisements for like El Al Airlines, they'll say, is it time for you to Aliyah? Is it time for you to come home, yeah. to go up, to go up to Jerusalem, to go up to Israel? And so this 1956 is when the doors of Israel opened and said, we're going to start paying for the airfare and for the trips of Jews to come home. And yet, and that's what it says, I will draw the people from around the world back home to your land. Amen. And so the verse says the very thing that happens. In 5727 it says, just like Og of Bashan and Sion were defeated, the king of Bashan, well, we saw last week that Bashan is the Golan Heights. And in 1967, that was the Six Days War, when Israel gained the entire Sinai Peninsula and the Golan Heights. The map of the Middle East was changed forever in 1967, when the Golan Heights were taken. Okay? So all of this coincides. It coincides with some major events. The year 5733 
is Deuteronomy 31. Let's begin there tonight, okay? Let's begin there tonight. 5733 is Deuteronomy. will be primarily Deuteronomy, and I'm going to have to do a lot of flipping and flopping around. There will be a few New Testament things we might get a chance to look at. But Deuteronomy 31. If we start in verse 8, verse 10 is the actual verse, okay? That's the year and day. But again, we can wobble back and forth. But if we were starting in verse 8, it says, The Lord is the one who goes ahead of you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. So, Moses wrote this law and gave it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who carried the Ark of the Covenant, of the Lord to all the elders of Israel. Then Moses, here's our verse, then Moses commanded them saying, at the end of every seven years, at the time of the year of remission of debts, at the feast of booths, when all of Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place which he shall choose, you shall read this law in front of all of Israel in their hearing. So what's he saying? In seven years, you're gonna have a Sabbath, you're gonna have a Jubilee, and I'm going to be there with you. It's a foretelling of the fact that the jubilee may be a little shaky, may be a little rocky, but don't, don't, don't worry, we're going to get there. Okay? We're going to get there. So when we look at 5733, it's the year 1973. And 1973 is the Yom Kippur War. It is... You're a little out there. Okay, the Yom Kippur War. Okay? And the Yom Kippur War is the war where Israel regained all of their land mm -hmm. and gained even a little more of the land, but it happened exactly seven years after the first year that we just looked at. Yeah. You got the Six Days War, and then seven years later, in the Jewish calendar, not in our calendar, but in the Jewish calendar, they have a second war, and God is with them. The Yom Kippur War is actually called the War of Miracles by the Jews. What? War of what? The War of Miracles. Because there are Palestinian and Syrian fighters who said that they ran up to the one tank that was surviving or the one company that was surviving or the one soldier that was fighting and I'm telling you guys there are books of these. There are literally books written by Arabs. By Arabs who say that they the Jews had fallen. And they were going to go take the building, or they were going to take the land. And so 12 men ran up to one man, and one Jew was standing there. And the one Jew killed all but the one who lived to tell the story. Or an angel blocked their way. Now, Arabs believe in angels. They do. I must always believe in, in angels. They have angelic beings. But they were told that there's a, I have stood in the spot next to the southern wall of Jerusalem, okay. where Adi Boran, who is one of the most decorated soldiers in all of Israel, he's been in three major wars. He was in the War of Independence, he was in the Six Days War, he was in the Yom Kippur War as an older man and a general. But Adi Boran said, all of my soldiers were damaged, they were hurt, and so I grabbed a gun and put on the helmet to protect the southern wall of Jerusalem. And so he's in the trenches with his men, he's a general, he's supposed to be back at headquarters, making decisions, and the 14 men that are left, he makes the 15th man, are standing their ground to protect the southern wall so that the paratroopers can go in and take over the city. Get the picture? Yeah. All right, so as he's there, he's there, he sees, I don't remember if it was a company or battalion, but it was about 40 men, 40 Jordanians, and they came storming up from Gehenna, from the Hinnom Valley, Valley up to that ridge that they're on, and they shot until they were out of bullets. They were out of bullets. Mm -hmm. And the Jordanians, there's about a dozen of them left. They haven't killed very many people. They've just shot and missed like crazy, but they've held the ground for the paratroopers to take. And the Jordanians began to run across the field with their guns poised and guns blurred, and all 12 of them jammed, and they fought hand to hand and took the 12 men prisoner. Oh, my word. They took the palace, they took the Jordanians prisoner. And so this is documented. I mean, there's the men, there's the guns, there's no bullets. And, and the guys in the, in the uh, prisoner of war camp are telling the story, yes, this is what happened. 
And so I, I stood on that very hill, that very ridge on the south, and just, I looked at the topography and went, wow, that's really where this is where it was. And this is where God jammed 12 guns. Uh -huh. 12 guns. So, Yom Kippur War, okay? And this verse emphasizes the don't worry, God's with you, okay? But this is going to happen. So six years later, Syria tried to regain all of that land in Israel, but Israel prevailed. Okay. That particular war uh, looks a little bit like this. You can see the invasion from the south. You can see the invasion from the north. And they held on to the Golan. Uh, we've actually seen the film here. It's been a couple of years, but we saw the film of one of the tank commanders that talks about being the lone tank going down into a valley of the Golan. You remember that? And that he saw 12 tanks out there. And he said, I'm a dead duck. I am a dead duck. And all of those tanks started to fire, and all the shells went over him and landed behind him. And they kept missing him. And he kept inching forward. And they kept shooting <laughs> over him. And he inched forward. And they kept shooting over him. And when he got close enough, he took out four of the tanks, and the others surrendered. And when he said, why, why did you surrender and why did you shoot over us? And they said, we knew that you were the decoy and that there had to be more behind you. <laughs> we knew the tactic. We knew you Jews, we knew how you fight, and there was more on the other side of the hill, so we're trying to take out the people on the other hand because we're not going to waste our shells on the decoy. He was the only one. Yeah, the only one. So miracle upon miracle upon miracle Amen. of God the year 5746. <laughs> when we look at that verse, we have 3123. So let's look at Deuteronomy 3123. Then he commissioned Joshua, the son of Nun, and said, Be strong and courageous, for you shall bring the sons of Israel into the land which I swore to them, and I will be with you. Now this is Moses talking. To Joshua and saying God is going to take you and you're the one that's going to take them into the promised land but don't worry you're not Moses but God's with you alright so when we look at that particular date that date is 1986 5746 is the year 1986 in our calendar and this is the year that Russia released their Jews finally let them go on finally let them go on so it says for you shall bring the sons of Israel into the land which I swore to them, and I will be with you. So this was the first time that a Russia allowed the Jews out, that they didn't have to smuggle themselves out under the cover of darkness and night, and we, you know, smuggle uh, with like coyotes and stuff to get out of the country. And it began in that one, I mean, in a two-year period, in the two years of the fall to fall, 600,000 Russian Jews were released from Russia. 600,000 were released from Russia. And it says, and I'll, you'll bring them back to the land, and I'll be with you. In 1984-1986, straddling this, a program started called Operation Moses. Operation Moses was an attempt to get the Ethiopian and the Yemenite Jews out because they were being wholesale slaughtered. They were being killed. In the, I mean, they literally were going to their house like ISIS, dragging them out and shooting them on the spot if they found out that they were Jews. They were taking them and saying, we're going to take you to a refugee camp where you'll be fed while you'll be taken care of. They took them to the camp and they killed them, lined them up against the fence and killed them. And so uh, two Mossad agents, you know, the Secret Service, the Special Service, Mossad, two, two Mossad men, said, God put it on our heart that we had to be the Joshua's and the Moses who would bring the Jews out of Ethiopia and Yemen. We could not let millions of brothers and sisters die at the hands of barbarians and, and unbelievers. And so two men smuggled themselves into the country and they had an Ethiopian who lived there who was a Jew, a black African Jew who was gathering 12 at a time and secreting them out to the border and those two Jewish boys would meet them with a truck and rush them into the Sudan which at that time was safe. The Sudan was safe land. 
Well, while they were doing that, the Sudanese rebellion started, and then Sudan actually became more dangerous than Yemen and Ethiopia. So the only place that they could go was to the sea, the Red Sea, the parting of the Red Sea. The only way that they could go was to get them to the coast because the Muslims had now surrounded and they were in total revolt and rebellion. Muslim killing Muslim, Muslim killing Christian. It goes on today in Sudan. There's still Christians are being killed more than we can count in Sudan today. But these two Jews took it upon themselves. Well, when the country, when the land closed, they went back to Israel. And the Mossad said, it's over. It's done. We got as many as we could. And they said, well, we didn't even get 20% of them. We didn't even get 20% of the Jews out. 80%. Oh, our brothers and sisters are going to die in a God-forsaken land because we're giving up. And they said, we're not giving up. There's no way to get them out. One of the guys got an idea. Netflix just created a movie called The Red Sea Diving Resort. These two Jews went in posing as Frenchmen with French passports and citizenship and said, there's an old diving resort that is out of business and decrepit. And they went to the Ethiopian government and said, as two Frenchmen who have ties to Ethiopia, we still have trade with you, we would like to take that and turn it into a booming business. We think, you know, the Red Sea is one of the most beautiful diving spots in the world. It's if not the first, it's second in the beautiful deep sea diving of uh, scuba diving. So we'd like to start a resort. And this movie just came out last month uh, on Netflix called The Red Sea Diving Resort of how the Mossad for two years ran a business smuggling Jews out of Africa. All right. Chris Evans, who plays Captain America, stars in the movie. A lot of people think we look alike because he's so good looking. I can see, <laughs> I can see the resemblance. You know, he's such a pretty man. But anyway, he, he plays the head of the guy. And this is him with the actual Mossad agent who 20 years ago, 30 years ago, actually did this action. And he was the uh, head um, technical director for the movie. But what they, what they did was in the middle of the night, that Ethiopian would smuggle people into buildings in nowhere, you know, girls' towns, and those people would have to fend for themselves for sometimes as much as a week. They would have to take care of their own water, their own food, they eat roots, they eat leaves, any way that they could exist. These guys then would pick them up in a truck and put them on a boat and say, we're going out night diving. We're doing a night diving tour, and it's full of Africans going, yes, we are. <laughs> we go diving in water now. Yeah, I mean, not a one of them is gonna swim. And they took their boats out, and the Israeli Navy met them with submarines and trawlers and took them home. How about that? Took them back to Israel. And that was Operation Moses, and I will bring them into the land. So really, really cool. Really cool that that would coincide. If we look at the year 5763 and 5774, uh, 64, we look at 63 and 64, we're looking at Deuteronomy 32, 10 through 12. Deuteronomy 32. So let's change chapters. We've got a little bit of third. Now, the little paper that I gave you, if you look at the paper, I've given you, on the left column is the Jewish year, right? And then I give you the American or the Western year, and then I give you the verse in Deuteronomy. So it's 33 colon 4, 33 colon 5. Now again, not every verse coincides to something historical. Please excuse me if some of that chart is not accurate because I did it on Excel and sometimes cut and paste is not accurate. And when you ask Excel to count, sometimes it skips a number and stuff. But it should be pretty close. It should be a pretty close reference for you. So if you look at 5763 and 5764 on that chart, what year is that in our... Three and four. Okay, so that, that's your verse, right? Let's see where we at. Yeah, so we're looking at 2003 and 2004. Okay, so 2003, listen to Deuteronomy 3210. Uh, this will be 3210 says, 
He found him in a desert land, and in the howling waste of a wilderness, he encircled him. He cared for him. He guarded him as the pupil of his eye. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that hovers over its young, he spread his wings and caught them, and he carries them in his pinions, his little pin feathers, right? The Lord alone guided him, and there was no foreign God with him. So this is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and there was no foreign pagan God involved. So what does that have to do with the year 2003? Well, can anybody remember what happened in 2001 to the United States? That was 9-11. 9-11 was 2001. Folks, 2003 was the Iraqi war when the evil of America went to the Middle East. And what's mentioned here? Like an eagle that stirs up its nest. We were stirred up. But we waited two years, two years. George W. Bush waited from 2001 to 2003 to see if a coalition of the United Nations and others would strike back at this attack on America. And when they would not, he took the coalition that he had and said, I'm giving you two years to turn over the people. Two years to turn over the perpetrators of this crime. Two years to give us Osama bin Laden. And when they didn't, we struck and we struck hard. Mm -hmm. And so 2003, look what it says. He found him in a desert land. Yeah. Listen to it. Listen, now that you know what it's about. And in the howling waste of a wilderness, he encircled him. He cared for him. Gordon was the pupil of his eye. That's Israel. We're protecting Israel while we're looking for him. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest that hovers over its young, he spread his wings and caught them. The Lord alone guided him, and there was no foreign god with him. Folks, the United States is Christian and worships the same God as Israel, the God of Abraham. So the people that came to help them were a godly nation. There was no other God involved, no other religion involved. So the Iraqi war. America moved into the Middle East in a wholesale version, and began acting for the first time in our history, we began the active defense of Israel. <coughs> the active defense of Israel was in 2003, and that's what the verse says will happen. That's what it predicted when God wrote it at least 6,000 years ago. Okay? So what does 2004 mean? Well, 2004, if we look at the next year, Israel has every right to defend itself, a president of the United States said for the first time. George W. Bush said, Israel has a right to defend itself. And so he legitimized the Yom Kippur War. He legitimized the 67 War. Presidents of the United States had not taken a stand on any of those actions. They always said, well, it was provocation, but you need to show temperance, and you need to show control, and you don't. George W. Bush was the first one in 2004 who said, you have a right. They have a right. Amen. Deal with it. They have a right. Just deal with it. So in 2003, 2004, we see this verse again being supplied and being fulfilled. Okay? 5769. 57, Look at Deuteronomy 32, 16 to 20. Yeah. 16 to 20 says, They made him jealous with strange gods. With abominations they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons who were not God. To gods whom they have not known. New gods who came lately when your fathers did not dread. You neglected the rock. You neglected the rock, and it's a capital R, right? You neglected the rock who begot you and forgot the God who gave you birth. The Lord saw this and spurned them because of the provocation of his sons and daughters. Then he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be. For they are a perverse generation, sons in whom is no faithfulness. This is not a good word for Israel, is it? This is not a good word. This is Israel has strayed and is going to get into problems. And we know that that particular year, at this, at this point in the Torah, things 
change. If you'll read 30 and 31, which we have, they've been loving, protecting, we're going to draw people, everything's out the door, and things are pure and clean. But at this point, if we read on, there are earthquakes, there are fires, there are terror. Let's read down just a little bit farther. Um, look at verse 22. For a fire is kindled in my anger and burns to the lowest part of Sheol and consumes the earth with its yield and sets on fire the foundation of the mountains. I will heap misfortune on them. I will use my arrows on them. Who wants God to put his arrows on you? No. No. Ugly, okay? Then it turns out we know that God's going to put arrows. His arrows, not your arrows. He's going to use his arrows. They will be wasted by famine, consumed by plague and bitter destruction. And the teeth of beasts I will send upon them with the venom of crawling things to the dust. Outside the sword will bereave and inside... Terror. Terror with him. Both young men and virgin, the nursing with the man of gray hair. I would have said, I'll cut them to pieces. I'll remove the memory of them from men. Had I not feared the provocation by the enemy. In other words, if I did it, that's going to let the enemies destroy them. And I don't want to do that. I've got to keep strong. So, we have the word terror. We have fire. We have destruction. We have explosions. We've got famines. We've got all kinds of things that suddenly change in the middle of Deuteronomy 32. Things switch. Yeah. But we don't have time to talk about the time. We'll pick it up next week. <laughs> we'll talk about what happened in those years and what actually transpired. And it is, let me just say, that the year that we're about to talk about is in the Jewish press called the year of embarrassment, and the year of terror. The year of embarrassment and the year of terror. Speaking of itself. In the Jewish press of the nation of Israel. Okay. okay? So we'll look at it next week. We'll pick up here and we, we just have about three more dates to talk about. And we're going to get into the prophetic now. We're, we're getting into the current, you see. Right. We're up to where we are. And now we're going to look and see what do some of the coming verses say. And what can we look at that possibly could happen in the future? And again, we don't know until it happens. Do we? I mean, no, no. you don't know what's prophetic until afterwards and say, hey, didn't you bring that up earlier? Yes, you did. Otherwise, we're just conjecturing. We'll, we'll look at some things that could happen, and we'll look at uh, another, we'll look at one very important number that we've not ever dealt with here. We've never dealt with this particular number in our numerology studies. But it fits into this study like a hand in a glove. Mm -hmm. I absolutely just dovetail together. And uh, we'll let you take it from there next week. Okay? Yeah. We'll finish up next week.